for you to come back on. So <laughs> <laughs> let's, uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for today, for the various activities that have gone on. Um, we thank you for um, the beautiful weather we've been having, even though it's cold and we'll be getting colder. We, we know that uh, this is part of the nature that you've created and, and we get to enjoy for a while. Uh, Lord, we ask that tonight as we study your word, as we study um, 1 Peter chapter 1, that um, you will make yourself known to us in a very, very special way. Um, and that we will constantly remain focused on what you've done for us and what you're going to do for us. We ask all this in your precious name. Amen. You're not implying God created coal and snow. Well, <laughs> you know, some people might think it's a result of the fall, but you know. <laughs> it was. Yeah. They didn't wear clothes in the garden, so it couldn't have been that cold. <laughs> <laughs> okay so let's get into first peter shall we thank you dad <laughs> um just a reminder and a little bit of review from last week uh first peter uh, chapter one verses uh, particularly verses three to five um peter was talking about what it meant to be a child of god what it means to be saved and be a, a child of god and and if you remember we mentioned last week that First Peter verses three through verse twelve is basically one long, huge run-on sentence, and so as soon as he gets done talking about what it means to be a, a child of God, without any kind of transitional event or any you know, take a break for a sip of coffee or anything like that, he he begins to look at the experiences that Christians in, in, in the churches that he's sending his letter to are, are beginning to face. And, uh, and so that's where we're going to pick up today in 1 uh, Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 6. And I believe, Mom, you are planning on reading that. <laughs> I'm hoping. <laughs> yeah. 1 <laughs> Peter 1, 6. In all this, you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Uh, I like that he uh, looks and says, basically, <laughs> you are rejoicing greatly. Um, not, just, not just a regular normal rejoice, you know, but a, a great rejoice. And, um, and, and I like, uh, in, particularly in the, in the NIV, um, it could, it, could be, it could be more of a command to rejoice. But I think uh, I think they I think the NIV has it a little bit better when they when it says you are it's something we're doing as Christians uh, and the the churches that Peter is writing to um, are already doing greatly rejoicing. Um, <clears throat> the interesting thing is that at the very beginning of that verse it says in all this and uh, we're assuming um, when Paul, when Peter writes all this um, he doesn't. It'd be nice if he actually told us what the this is talking about, but as as you know, if you, if you have that kind of a, a grammar structure, you, you look at the previous passages or previous sentences to find out what the this is. And uh, unfortunately for us, there are two things that it could be in the previous passages. It could be talking, uh, this is talking about the assurance of Jesus' return. Um, or, or this could be talking about uh, so great a salvation. Uh, we're not exactly sure which, and actually I probably would like to go with both, but it's pro probably talking about both, our, our great assurance of salvation and the fact that we know that, that Jesus is, is coming back. <clears throat> in, uh, and, and I think that that comes across in, in, in this passage as well. The thought of our salvation reminds us then of all of the promises that are part of that and promises for our, our daily living as, as well as the certainty of Jesus returning. Um, and, and that when Jesus returns will be the end of the suffering that, uh, that the church is going through, the churches we're going through in Peter's time, and, the, and frankly, the many places the church is going through today as well. The, uh, the verb that Peter uses when he talks about um, 
rejoicing is uh, and describing that joy uh, carries with it the idea of in, the intense joy, great rejoicing, overjoyed. Um, and, uh, and we understand that to be more than just your garden variety. I, I, I experienced joy when I had my pizza the other day. Um, this is a joy that God brings, uh, even as he brings peace. And, and we, we see even Jesus' words. Um, he talks about the same thing. Uh, Mom, Matthew chapter 5, verse 12. <clears throat> Rejoice and be glad. Because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Um, you know, again, P uh, Jesus is saying we, we rejoice even though we're going through suffering. And Peter says we rejoice even though we're going through suffering. It seems to be a common theme in 2 Corinthians. Paul says, guess what? <laughs> we rejoice even though we're going through suffering. Um, and, and so I think that's probably uh, one of the marks of a genuine Christian is the, the joy we feel, even if things around us don't seem to be going the way we had particularly hoped for them to go. The verb rejoice that's found here in this verse is in the present tense, which implies that it's going on at the moment and is expected to continue to go on. It's something that's active and real it's not well you will rejoice eventually no you are rejoicing right now and 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 i think the force of that um tense uh, says basically you know we we are rejoicing and we will continue to rejoice i think that's a very powerful statement that peter makes that that the bible makes that uh, even in the midst of trials we can we can we can rejoice um I find it also pretty interesting. You, you, you know that there are several different kinds of Greek language, uh, and particularly written language. You have the classical Greek language that you know, Plato and Aristotle uh, wrote in. You have biblical Greek language, which is quite a bit different than, than classical Greek. And modern Greek has absolutely nothing to do with any of it. So it's pretty much completely different. Um, in, in this particular passage of scripture, this, this word rejoice is found in biblical Greek, but it's not found in, in the secular and the classical Greek anywhere. And uh, whenever it's used in the Bible, and it's used fairly frequently in the Bible, those couple of passages we already mentioned, um, it always carries this idea of a deep and spiritual joy, um, a rejoicing in God or in what God has done for us. You know, s salvation is not uh, some brief feeling that we get, the joy we get from, uh, you know, it's not a brief feeling or an emotion one gets when everything's going well. But it's something that's permanent, and and the the Bible wants us to remember that it's not dependent on our circumstances. Joy in, in Jesus is 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 something we experience, whether things are going well or whether things are going poorly. Uh, Psalm fifty one twelve, David prays, and he says, "Restore to me the joy of your salvation." You know, he understood that joy and salvation was something that needed to be an ongoing event. Um, and, uh, and, the, and I think one of the unique features about this kind of rejoicing that, that the Bible talks about is that it is evident in the life of the believer, even as we are suffering grief in all kinds of trials. Um, and, and that it's a, it's a real paradox to the outside world. They look at us and say, How, you, you're suffering. How can you have joy and suffering at the same time? It doesn't make sense. And we said, well, and we, we can turn around and say, well, let me introduce you to the guy that helps make sense. Let me tell you about my savior. Um, <clears throat> I think it's a, a powerful witness to the world around us. Um, Verse six kind of concludes with the statement that, you know, now for a little while you've had to suffer grief and all kinds of trouble. And, and I like that, that Peter says, this is, 
This is for a season. This is for a time. Now for a little while. You know, this, the sufferings will pass and, and, and pass quickly. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4, 17. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. You know, our, our light and momentary troubles, you know, no matter how bad things seem to be, they're, they're light, they're momentary. Uh, the provision we have been promised in Jesus goes far beyond our current trials. Our, and, and I love that our trials are only going to be lasting for a little while and, 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 and eternity lasts forever. But that's, I like that. But. Here's the problem. Why do I have to suffer anyway? It's okay to say, hey, it's only going to be a short while. Uh, you're going to go home to be with the Lord. Eternity's long. Why must I suffer at all? Uh, wouldn't it be nice if God undertook so I didn't have to? Well, verse 7 answers that in part. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus is revealed. Paul says, hey, you know what? There is a purpose to it. It's not just happening. I'm using it. I'm using it in your life. I'm using it in, as a testimony to me. Uh, Paul introduces that, uh, Paul Peter introduces that in verse 6 with that little word, so that. Uh, the tr thrust of this is that th the time is going to come when Jesus returns and we go to be with him. And at that point, we're going to understand something more of what God did for us and through us and for his glory in our suffering. Uh, Peter wanted them to understand uh, that behind all of that suffering, uh, God had a purpose, had a reason for allowing it to take place. Uh, they were facing trials. Uh, Peter's up front and says, so that your faith may prove genuine and may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. The, one of the purposes of trials coming our way is to prove the genuineness of our faith, not so much proving the fact that we have made a commitment to Jesus, but proving what that faith really means to us. Uh, Non-Christian world talk about, oh, I've got the world by a tail, and everything's going fine, and I'm not worried about anything, and then all of a sudden something happens and they fall apart. Christians have a joy a peace that comes so that things don't fall apart that way. When we, talk, when we talk about faith in scripture, we sometimes talk about doctrinal faith, the faith we believe, uh, the faith we defend. Here it's personal faith and the personal commitment and uh, what that means to us. Contemplating salvation and the coming conclusion uh, should generate real joy in our hearts. And so that uh, we can endure the temporary suffering because we know what's coming down the road. And they say today, no pain, no gain. Uh, for the Christian, a little suffering, think about the gain that will be ours. The, the problem facing Christians in Asia Minor was that they were they had all kinds of grief and all kinds of trials, uh, even though it was just for a little while. Peter wanted to see that the purpose of that was, so your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes, even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus returns is revealed. The illustration of faith being greater value than gold is rather interesting from a couple of different perspectives. For the most part, the world views gold as the most precious of all the metals uh, and most valuable of all of them. And uh, Peter's saying here, well, yeah, you know what? I'm not saying it's not valuable, 
but your faith is more valuable than even that. And gold, if it's going to be genuine, uh, is refined through a process of, of fire whereby the dross is, is drawn off from it and the pure gold is left. And uh, in a sense, Peter's saying, you know, in the same way, your trials are proving the genuineness, the realness of your faith. Not only that, he's saying gold ultimately will perish. Uh, it everything's going to perish. Gold heated too high disappears. Your faith will not perish, even though it's being refined by fire. And the faith that we have will be proven genuine uh, at the last days. Now, he doesn't get into necessarily the, the source of all of that faith. And some of it, I think God sends our way uh, to refine us. Sometimes that uh, those trials and difficulties come simply because we live in a sin-cursed world. We get cancer. We get whatever. Uh, nothing to do with God saying, I want you to have it. Uh, sometimes we, we get into the difficulty because of our own stupidity and things we do. But the reality of it is that in all of that, God says, yes, but I can take it and I can use it to refine you and to bring glory to myself. Christians can rejoice even when things are not going the way they want. Uh, and uh, that's part of the, the gracious provision that he made in our salvation. The uh, phrase is rather interesting. He says it will result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus is come. It's going to result in genuine Christian praise, honor, and so forth. Peter used three different words here, that praise, glory, and honor. Praise is God's acknowledgement of our faith. Uh, the odd idea is depicted by Jesus, who, who spoke of the faithful servants in, in Matthew chapter 24, a whole long section from verses 14 to 28. But in particular, verse 23 talks about that. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Praise when we're in the presence of the Lord. And he says, you know what? You've been faithful even when things didn't go well. Talks about glory. And uh, again, reflecting the fact that when we are with Jesus, we're going to in some way be like him. Uh, we're going to reflect the truth of the glory of God in our lives. Romans 8.18 8, expresses that. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. I don't know what all that's going to involve. Um, and I don't want to find out right away. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> You know, he is going to do some marvelous things for us. And then the honor that's spoken of here, uh, given to believers in the, in the heavenly kingdom. Uh, Jesus spoke of this in John 12, 26. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Oh, those are uh, blessings that will be ours, even though we're going through the trials and difficulties, when we can see them from God's perspective. The blessings of praise, glory, and honor. Uh, and they're referred to here as coming with the return of Jesus. And uh, when he comes again, uh, he's going to bring with him the rewards for those who are faithful. Peter is saying in the meanwhile, in your present setting, uh, you know what? You're going to be mocked. Difficulties are going to come. Uh, you're going to be ridiculed. Uh, you're going to be persecuted. But guess what? That's all going to be reversed. When I come again, instead of what the world, the way the world treats you, I'm going to show you my thanksgiving for what you've done. My glory will be shared with you and, and you will be uh, honored. I think those verses kind of come at the heart of what Peter's trying to say for us. 
he, he began by praising God for such a great salvation. And then he paused to show that the Christians in Asia Minor uh, were exceedingly glad. And in the final days, that gladness will become even more evident as they realize the blessings that are theirs. They can be glad because they will survive and uh, the trials and so forth will come to an end. And what a glorious salvation we have. First Peter one verse eight. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. I, I love how Peter is talking to the people in Asia Minor. And he says, you know, you guys have never met the person of Jesus. Um, and yet you love him. You know, Peter, Peter met the person of Jesus. Peter walked around with him and, and, and learned from him and spent, you know, three years of his life sitting at the feet of Jesus, and going around and, and, and seeing the miracles and seeing, listening to the teaching, everything like that. And they've been passing that on to other people. But these other people don't have the same experiences that Peter has. And yet Peter can come to them and say, you know, even though you haven't seen him the way I saw him in person, you love him. Um, and, and, and I think that's a very powerful statement and, and, and one that, that we can, can grab hold of too. We, we have not seen Jesus here on earth walking around and eating and breathing and, and, and that kind of stuff. And yet we, like the people in, in Asia Minor, can, can, can join with Peter and say, yeah, we, we love him. Um, I, I, I hearken back to um, right after Jesus' resurrection when all the disciples were in the, the upper room and uh, that first time they showed up, uh, Thomas wasn't there. Um, I feel sad that they we call him Doubting Thomas. If you read the rest of the story of Jesus, Thomas is the one that doubts, I think, the least, you know, he's, he's the one that says, if you're going to, Jesus, if you're going to go to Jerusalem and die, let's all go and die with you, you know, he, he's definitely not a doubter, and yet this one time he says, well, unless, unless I actually see him and, and touch the wounds and feel his side, I, I won't believe, and uh, Jesus shows up, and uh and says, "Hey, hey, Thomas, come, come here. I want you to I want you to touch my hands and touch the side." And the Bible says that you know Thomas hit the ground and says and his knees at the ground, and, um, you know, says, "Oh, my Lord and my God." And I think Jesus says, "Uh, -uh you're not getting away that easy. Come here, feel." <laughs> Just, just because you see me, you wanted to feel and then go ahead. And, and uh, then Jesus turns to, to Thomas in, in John chapter 20, verse 21, 29, sorry, makes a very profound statement that ties right in with what Peter is saying here. John 20, 29. Jesus says, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And that ties right in with what Peter's writing to the churches in, in Asia Minor and, and us today as well. We fall into that category of those who have not seen and, and yet believe. <clears throat> the, the word that Jesus, that Peter, sorry, <laughs> the word that Peter uses for the word love here and when it says you love him uh, is, the, is the Greek word agape. As and most of you know, that there are several different words that are all translated love in English. We have the, the eros love, which is a love between husband and a wife. You have the, the philo love, which is a brotherly, sisterly love. Philadelphia, the br city of brotherly <laughs> love. Um, and then you have this agape love. And the agape love is is what is considered the ideal love, God's love. And that's and that's what 
Peter uses here. He uses that word, the agape love, to talk about our love for Jesus. Um, <clears throat> the word love, again, is used in the present tense and just just <laughs> as, as joy was. So it's an ongoing, uh, continual, regular love, uh, regular activity. And uh, I think it's, it's very powerful that uh, the implications of, of loving Jesus, whom they haven't seen, mm -hmm. is that they, they have this powerful love relationship with the ascended Jesus. Um, and, and that love relationship would have been uh, carried on by the churches through, through prayer, through worship through uh, study of, of the written words that uh, people have, have put down. Um, First Peter was most probably written in six, between 62 and 64 AD. At that point, Paul had been already writing letters for about 10, 12 years. And I think First Thessalonians was probably written in 52 AD. And Paul mentions in several of his letters, take these letters and pass them around to the churches. The, the, the letters that Paul is writing are, write, are, are the same people. They're, they're to the churches in Asia Minor, to Corinth and to Ephesus. And so, and so the, the, the letters of Paul are being, are being passed around. And it's, it's part of the body of knowledge that, uh, the, that these churches have that, it's, that makes up who they are and how they know how to love Jesus the way they're supposed to. We have the complete New Testament. They didn't have that quite yet, um, but they had they had certain things, certain parts of it, and even some of the gospel passages, gospel um, uh, the gospel writers have been writing already, and, and that information is being spread around the church, the, the sayings of Jesus when he was alive. Peter uses the word believe, and it means to, to trust in sufficiently that one has confidence in and, and therefore willing to depend on something. You believe in something so strongly that you depend on it. Um, and in, in this case, Peter is declaring that they have the, the trust in and have put their full confidence. They depend on Jesus. You know, having, having trusted Jesus with their, their salvation from sin, um, the and and for the for the 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 ending of the the pain of sin, they can now trust Jesus for uh, the the ending of the pain of <coughs> suffering and persecution that's going to happen, the the future salvation from from pain and suffering. Um, <clears throat> the word believe uh, that's mentioned in this in this particular verse. Um, is is a very interesting one because it carries the idea of 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 into I guess when when the two words are combined into believing um, it's describing their faith as in as if in some way they are going into the Jesus and resting and remaining there uh, I love that that particular idea loving Jesus is, is both the reason for believing um, that they've already done that, but it's also the result of believing, and they're doing that now. When, when one sees in Jesus and his provisions on the cross a reason to love him, and one then places their trust in him, and the more we trust in Jesus, the greater our love for him grows. The word for rejoice that's used in this particular verse is very similar to the word believe. It's in the present tense. It's an ongoing joy, um, continually rejoicing. And actually, this is the second time in that Peter kind of references Christians rejoicing. Um, in, in this slightly different uh, emphasis here. In verse 6, we mentioned earlier tonight that uh, the joy of the Christian is to the future hope in the return of Jesus and his reward in heaven but here peter is talking um uh, reflecting on a joy a, a christian has because of their personal everyday fellowship with jesus it's not necessarily in in context it's not looking forward to 
to what's going to happen in the future. It's how are we living right now? We rejoice right now because of what Jesus is doing in our lives right now. Um, no matter no matter how difficult or challenging the circumstances, Christians should never stop rejoicing over the greatness of, of their salvation. Um, and, and this joy is, is present even when one is hurting or suffering because we as Christians know we're not going through it alone. Uh, Psalm 96 verse 2 is a, is a powerful statement of, of this same thing. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day. You know, the joy that a, a Christian can and should have is, is the daily awareness that, uh, that we walk with Jesus. And, and I love how Peter says it's inexpressible and glorious. So inexpressible, of course, that which cannot be put into words. Of course, he's writing the words inexpressible. So, uh, but but it's, it's really much, is basically saying, I, I wish I could explain this. I just can't. It's inexpressible. And then glorious is is related to the to the word we get doxology from, and it's uh, in a tense in the Greek that implies something that's infused, put into something else. It becomes part of that something else. You know, if you take uh, your coffee and you you put some cream and sugar into it, it's infused. Of course, why anyone would put cream and sugar in coffee? <laughs> I don't know in the first place, but. <laughs> coffee if, if if god wanted coffee to be creamy and sweet he would have made it that way that's that's another story altogether um in this case in in the bible uh, uh in, in first peter it's the glory of god that's infused it's added to our our walk with jesus you know we we not only walk with jesus who who dwelt among us and became human and and understands us because he experienced a lot of the same things we experience. But we also walk with a Jesus who is divine and, and, and part of the, the Godhead that, that we, can, we can worship and, and celebrate. Jesus can be understood as a real person with whom I can have fellowship with, while at the same time he is God. One of the uh, challenges we find as we're seeking to grow in the Lord, I think, is how slow that process is from time to time. It's kind of like, you know, I wish I could go to the grocery store and buy spirituality and uh, just have it all packaged up nice and neat. It doesn't happen that way. And uh, 1 Peter 1.9 expresses the reality of that. <clears throat> For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You are receiving the end result of your faith. Now, that word receiving is in a tense in the Greek. And by the way, I don't know, remember much Greek, but uh, I'm sure that uh, Joel can help me with it. But uh, the commentaries talk about it in terms of being a a progressive receiving. Uh, it's something we get over a period of time. Uh, salvation that he talks about here are all of the blessings that are ours because uh, we have made a commitment to God. But the entire process of, of a Christian whereby we appropriate all of those blessings really is a lifetime uh, experience. Uh, some seemingly get more initially, and then the process sometimes slows down. And uh, ultimately, of course, we'll get it all when we are with Jesus and see him. But uh, the blessings, uh, which include the appropriation of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, the strength we need day by day to resist temptation, the peace that comes when things aren't going our way, that all comes to us via a process. And the Christian should be continually growing. And as we believe in Jesus and rejoice in him, it enables him to speed up to carry on that process of growth. And Jesus described this in John 
chapter 15, verses 9 to 11, he told his disciples, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. It's a process of remaining in the Lord. And then in uh, verse 10, Peter wrote, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care. Peter is looking at salvation, the salvation that he mentioned in verse 9. And uh, here he's looking at it kind of from the perspective of the Old Testament prophets. They spoke, they prophesied, they reflected on the, the grace of God. They recognized that a Messiah was coming. When he came, the law was going to be written on our hearts. They had all of this information but they couldn't put it all together. They really couldn't understand it all, which is understandable when we think in terms of uh, how we understand prophecy of the end, the return of the Lord. But uh, here he's saying, even though they couldn't put it all together, they searched out its meaning. Uh, they looked for when the prophet, the promised Messiah would come. And uh, it really, again, won't be until Jesus' life, death, and resurrection there. Peter mentions this at this point because what he's saying is you have a present hope. The very salvation that the ancient prophets spoke of didn't understand uh, in all of its detail, but they really wanted to understand it. I think part of what Peter is saying here is, you know, the, the privilege that you have is to share in truth that the prophets of the Old Testament didn't have. You live in AD instead of BC. The diligence, intensity of the ancient prophets desiring to know more about God uh, is Peter's way of saying they searched intently and with the greatest of care. Their passion was to know more of what the heart of God was and what was going to take place. Uh, and now that's been revealed in Jesus. And it's what's going on in the life of the uh, Christians who are facing persecution. Uh, verse 11 then takes a look at what it is that the Old Testament prophets were searching for, were hoping for, were waiting for. Uh, Mom, could you read First Peter chapter 1, verse 11? Trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. Peter, Peter here is kind of pointing out to the to the churches in Asia Minor these things that the Old Testament prophets were looking for. Um, they wanted to learn more about God's final, complete salvation and the judgment that would precede the end of history, or, or as we know from the New Testament, the, re the return of Christ. Um, there were many, many, many details that were hidden from them. But they, they searched their, their, the Old Testament diligently, uh, looking for, for clues as to the coming of the Messiah and, and tried to discover as much as they could about him. And, and, and Peter wanted to let the church know that it was the spirit of Christ in them that was encouraging them to seek out information about about himself. Jesus was was encouraging them to to look in scriptures, to come up with the prophecies, to, to understand the prophecies that were that were being uh, written about who Jesus was and what he was coming to earth to do. Uh, ultimately, they were investigating, according to Peter, the, the sufferings of Christ and the, the glories that would would follow. Um, 
<clears throat> and and we're sh we're sure that uh, although although Peter doesn't you know lay out verse for verse Old Testament prophecies that uh, are going on, we can we know it was the message of the prophets that detailed the the promised coming of the Messiah. Um, we'll get to verse twelve just a minute um, and, in in just a couple of minutes, and it, there it suggests it may also have been looking at conditions in their own times, the prophets' own times, to see if prophecies were being fulfilled in the events they saw taking place around them. You know, the Old Testament prophets were looking at, at uh, the current affairs and saying, is this, is this when, G when the Messiah is coming? Uh, I think we do that a lot today as well. You know, we, we look at um, the sinfulness of the, of the world around us and uh, and the way the world seems to be going and we look back at some of the prophecies concerning the coming of the second coming and you know as in the days of noah and, and we wonder are we are we in the day as in the days of noah are things as bad now as they were during the time of noah are we expecting the coming of the messiah um you know some people look at um 1948 when the nation of israel was formed and, and looking at that and saying, there, there's a sign of, that, uh, that, that Christ's return is imminent. Um, we look at the rise of modern technology and, and we see um, things heading towards a, a one world monetary system. And, and we wonder, you know, is this, is this the start of, you know, the, having to have a mark of the beast in order to buy and sell? I know there have been a lot of people that in the last two years have looked at this uh, coronavirus, COVID plague and said, you know, it sounds an awful like, lot like the, some of the plagues that are mentioned in the book of Revelation. Is the time drawing close? And the Old Testament prophets were doing that. The, the people that, uh, that Peter's writing to are doing that. We're we're doing that today. We could spend hours and hours and hours going through and looking at things. We may do that at some point, but we're not, we're not going to do it tonight. <laughs> and, um, but uh, but it really is uh, imp an important point to bring out that um, that that there that Jesus. Uh, and, and Jesus himself mentions in Matthew 13, 17. Mom, could you read Matthew 13, 17? I tell you, <clears throat> many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. You know, the Old Testament prophets were looking at, you know, who, when is the <clears throat> Messiah coming? And Jesus comes along and says, I'm here, you know, the, the Old Testament people long to see it, and they didn't get that chance to see me, and, but you have, and, and the people uh, that Peter is writing to are kind of the same thing, they, we, we live, we live this side of the, of the cross, and we can look back and say, oh yeah, that makes sense now, um, <clears throat> that, the, uh, the the prophets were looking at the, at both the suffering and the glory of Jesus, and passages like uh, Psalm twenty two, um, Isaiah fifty two, or reference the, the 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 fulfillment of Jesus coming, and uh, and Psalm two, Psalm sixteen, Psalm one ten, uh, kind of reflect the the fulfillment and victory of of uh, of Jesus. Peter wanted his readers to know that the things that they believed about their salvation were predicted in the Old Testament and were seen as significant enough that even the prophets wanted to know more about them. You know, the, the gospel message is not something that the, the disciples decided to make up after Jesus' death, but it was, it was part of God's plan. And all along, um, God was giving clues in his in his uh, word as to what was going to happen and and if it's part of God's plan there has to be a certainty about it 
uh, and that's and that's powerful. Of course, it's easy for us to look back at the Old Testament prophets and say, "How could you miss that? It's so obvious." Well, we're again we're this side of the manger and the empty tomb. You know, when you when you begin to look back at the Old Testament, if you if you looked if you were an Old Testament prophet and you started looking at at the prophecies of where Jesus was going to come from, for example, there were there at least three different places are mentioned as the the, the where Jesus where the Messiah is going to come from. Um, Micah five two says he's going to be born in the city of David in Bethlehem. Um, Hosea eleven one says eh, he's going to come out of Egypt. Um, and uh, and uh, that also talks about uh, Jesus um, coming from Nazareth, and you know, the Messiah being out of Nazareth. And you're like, wait a minute, how can how can the Messiah be from Nazareth and Bethlehem and Egypt? That just doesn't make sense. And you can't <laughs> put those three things together. And then Jesus came and his parents were from Nazareth and he went down to Bethlehem and was born in Bethlehem. And then they took off and went to Egypt for a while until Herod's death. And then they went back to Nazareth and those three things fit together perfectly. You know, we look, we look back and say, it's so obvious, but maybe not so obvious as we would think. When we look ahead, um, if you've ever read the book of Revelation, you know, there's there's mentioned that there's 10 uh, nations that get together and form a confederacy. And, you know, I'm sure we, when we look at it, we're like, ah, it could be this, it could be that. I mean, how is that possible? It's just not possible. And then Jesus is going to come back and everything's going to work out. And when we get to heaven, we're going to be like, oh, it's so obvious. Of course, that's how it was going to happen. It was prophesied all along. We just we just missed it again. <laughs> so I, I don't feel so bad that, that, uh, that the prophets missed it because I know we're going to miss we're going to miss something like that, too. The message that uh, of the prophets that God was going to judge sin was was really only a part of the of the message and the, the prophets understood that there was some kind of renewal uh, coming for the people of Israel and in some way it was connected to the Messiah and uh, and I, the, the the vision of of Ezekiel in particular you know we we hear that his his vision of a valley of dry bones but that's not that's not where the prophecy ended, was it? You know, the the bones came to life again. You know, there's there's coming you know, the things might be bad, but but there's going to be renewal. Um, the promise of forgiveness and restoration goes beyond a, a mere restoration of what we lost when we started to sin, but to a totally new existence based on God's final renewal. And I think that um, the Old Testament prophets understood that, that this restoration of humanity was for everyone, not just the Jewish people, but for the Gentiles as well. Although I'm sure the Old Testament prophets said, <laughs> we, we know that, we just can't, we can't put it together quite, quite, quite yet. We don't quite know how that's going to happen. Uh, the Spirit of Christ that is mentioned in this verse, again, the Holy Spirit at work in, in the lives of, of people, even, even in the Old Testament before Jesus sends the Holy Spirit to us. We know the Holy Spirit was involved in, in the Old Testament times, and uh, he's been at work in this world since the very beginning, and it was that Spirit that gave the prophets these messages that they were writing down and to help them to interpret it to their people. And he left me with 10 minutes to do 13 verses. <laughs> One verse. <laughs> One verse what we're going to get done. There's a lot more in this whole section that ties together, but uh, we're going to look at, at verse 12. And uh, Artie, I'll let you begin by reading that. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told to you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. 
Even angels long to look into these things. Peter says, it was revealed to them. The word that Peter uses there for reveal was always used in the New Testament to reflect on divine revelation. It was communication to the prophets, through the Holy Spirit, from God. There was a totally different Greek word that was used for one human being communicating with another, uh, human activity. Uh, that would, did Im kind of implied making known. This was a special word to say God was making this known to him and to them. And he says, they were not serving themselves, but you. Uh, again, tied into the fact that they really couldn't understand it all. They knew it was future. And uh, they were searching for it. But uh, there was just no way they could put it all together. They knew that the fulfillment of those promises for a Messiah, restoration of the kingdom, etc., was going to be future. Because the message for them was future, they weren't serving themselves, but they were writing it down for the future generation to see and understand who the Messiah really was. Uh, they were faithfully recording those prophecies, uh, not knowing who the Messiah was, when he would actually come, etc. But God is saying, you take this down because it's going to be important. <clears throat> Peter went on when they spoke of these things uh, that have been told to the, you by those who preach the gospel. The predictions, the prophecies, the message that was proclaimed as the good news to the churches in, in Asia Minor and to all, really were God's message. It wasn't, as we said earlier, uh, Peter coming up with something, but it was the foundation of the Old Testament prophets that made the New Testament message real. Uh, Peter made this point in a number of his sermons and really focused on it in his sermon on the, on the day of Pentecost. He said it's by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Uh, the power of, to present the gospel uh, has always been the power of the Holy Spirit. Initially, the Holy Spirit revealed those truths. Then the Holy Spirit made that message clear to the listeners. And, and again, I think a powerful message. The Holy Spirit came on us on the day of Pentecost, bringing a message. And if you and I are going to share that message, uh, be it with a teaching, whether it's neighbor to neighbor, whatever it happens to be, we need to do it in the power of the uh, Holy Spirit, which means we need to bathe it in prayer so that he would. Uh, Peter says, you know, no matter how intensely they sought for the, the reason of that, uh, they really were only serving the future. They were preparing the way for the later message. Uh, that would come. Uh, we in the church age, we have the great privilege of enjoying uh, not only the inauguration of God's salvation through Jesus, but then the growth of understanding where it's going. And uh, every day we are one day closer to his return. I found interesting that little phrase, even the angels uh, look and long to understand these things. The, the word Peter used here for the angels to look at it uh, implies something more than simple curiosity, but they have, a, a, they have, they had, and they still have a strong, passionate searching for it all. Uh, the word that he uses here for look uh, literally means to, to stretch one's head forward, uh, to bend down so you can see more closely. They want to understand what is taking place uh, and particularly the matters related to salvation. They want to know, they want to understand in some way the grace that God has displayed to us. A grace that from all we can gather, they never experienced. Grace was not given to the fallen angels. Uh, the, the holy angels don't need to be saved. And apparently the fallen angels can't be saved. So the idea of salvation is something unique to us. Uh, 
And interestingly, Paul again puts this in a tense that means they're continuing to marvel at the ongoing grace that God displays. They're looking down to gain a, a deeper view uh, of it. Uh, some have described it like, uh, you know, Jesus talks about the wedding attendees. Uh, they're trying to get a look, a closer look at the bride of Christ uh, as she appears. The angels brought, uh, brought in here uh, in terms of speculating about the activity to press on the minds of those who are listening to it, the privileges that are ours in salvation. Neither the prophets nor the angels understood all of it. But boy, it's been revealed to us through Christ and the gospels and the writings, and it's there to assure us. Okay, I finished with that. So Dan will answer any questions you have. <laughs> oh, I supposed to, I guess I should uh, ask you all to unmute, huh? <clears throat> if you have any questions or comments you would like to bring to us this evening, please feel free. Some pretty interesting things going on in this passage. <laughs> the way after our discussion last week, uh, questions came up about abusing God's grace and whether, you know, because we have God's grace, does that mean it covers everything and we don't have to worry about it? The good news on that is, no, we can't abuse it, but we don't have to look at that until next week because that's on next week's lesson and Peter talks about it then. <laughs> Okay, I always tell people, if you don't have any questions, one of two things, we either did such a good job, you understand it, or we did such a lousy job, you don't even know where to begin. <laughs> I'm going to assume you, we understood it. Let's just close in a word of prayer, and then we can chat and interact as, as we feel free to. Lord, again, it's your word. We rejoice in it. We, too often take salvation for granted some of us who grew up in the church have always known it and had a part of our lives and really don't stop often enough to reflect on what it would be like if we didn't know you the emptiness of our lives that peter will talk about in the in the next few verses help us lord to marvel at so great a salvation and to recognize that even when difficulties come our way that you're in them to the degree that you're using them to mold us into those that will bring honor and glory to you. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.